read a statement before we get going here. Um, <clears throat> so these events are being recorded and will be on our iQuiz YouTube channel. Uh, for bandwidth purposes, uh, we request you keep your microphone and video off until the end. Uh, if you have questions during the, the talk, which we encourage, please go ahead and post them in the chat channel, and then I will uh, uh, voice them for you. And then after the talk, we encourage you to turn your microphone on, your video on, and join us in, in the discussion. All right. So with that, it's our pleasure to have Ana uh, Aseno Garcia uh, joining us today. So Ana did her entire education in Madrid from bachelor's to PhD. She then did a brief postdoc uh, at ICFO in Barcelona and then spent uh, several years at Caltech uh, working with uh, Jeff Kimball and, and others doing theory related to atoms and nanophotonics and collective photonic, uh, photonic interactions. And then in 2019, she started uh, at Columbia and has been quite successful continuing that sort of research direction in the past several years. Um, and has recently won a number of awards, including the Sloan NSF Career, AFOSR, YIP, and very recently the Packard. Uh, so it's our great pleasure to have Anna joining us. And Anna, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much, Jake, for uh, inviting me. And I'm very happy to present our uh, work here. So, okay, I think I managed to share. Yeah, so please, if I hope you have questions, I'm always happy to stop and answer uh, them. So if Jake interrupts me, I, I definitely welcome that. Okay, so today I want to talk to you about uh, quantum many body physics with atoms and photons, which is a very broad uh, title, but what I mean in particular is this. So I'm interested in systems where we have many particles and these particles are typically two level systems. So they can be atoms, but they can also be, I don't know, superconducting qubits or molecules and so on. Uh, but then they are interacting with each other uh, because they share some reservoir, okay? And so basically, if we have a, an atom that is in some ground state, it can absorb a photon, promotes to excited state, decay, emits a photon. And you know, basically, this way, uh, the other, another atom will pick it up and will absorb it, and they will start talking. So there is a notion of dissipation in this problem because it's an open system where photons can escape. Um, but the important thing is that if this dissipation is correlated, then interesting things happen. And in particular, uh, through these uh, dissipative interactions, you may have, uh, for instance, you may develop entanglement between particles. And in free space, uh, dissipation, ten dissipation tends to be correlated when the distance between the particles is below the wavelength of the uh, relevant transition. So the main idea behind my talk is to use dissipation as a resource. And in particular, I'm gonna talk about order uh, arrays of atoms. So not so much disorder clouds, uh, but something that uh, now experimentalists are uh, able to do, which are 1D, 2D, and even 3D crystals of atoms. So um, I wanted to start by uh, some remarkable insight that I read in uh, the uh, quantum optics notes of Les Fouch of uh, Roy Glauber. So they are very nice uh, lecture notes. And in the first uh, part, uh, uh, page, they have a very beautiful uh, there is a very beautiful and insightful phrase that is that all of the delicate and ingenious techniques of optics are exercises in the constructive use of knots. So also you can claim that via the fluctuation dissipation theorem, this is the same as constructive use of dissipation. And this is precisely what my talk is going to be about. So I think of uh, you know, this idea of uh, atomic arrays and quantum optics in atomic arrays as merging two fields that have been a bit separate, that is that of condensed matter physics and quantum optics. So back in the day when people were uh, uh, trying to understand the nature of light, uh, that led to the development of quantum mechanics, right? Uh, and then if you care about, you know, uh, electrons jumping from one orbital to the other in an atom, then the next uh, natural question is what happens if you put a bunch of atoms together, you create a material, and then these electrons are hopping between these atoms and um, you can think of their, you know, band structure, how they uh, 
you know, basically moving this crystal. And then you can also think of what happens if there are interactions and you uh, uh, end up with, you know, strongly correlated physics. Um, if you care about photons, then um, this, uh, there is this other route where you start thinking about quantum optics. So the statistical properties of these photons. Um, and uh, this led to the development of uh, new types of light. So like for instance, coherent or uh, coherent light or lasers, and also even more quantum states of light like focus states, single photon states. Uh, and at the same time, uh, on top of that, there was a huge development of uh, uh, the huge development of cavity QED, where you basically place an atom uh, in between two mirrors and you control very efficiently the interaction of this single atom with a single optical mode, okay? Uh, and so if you try to scale up this system, then you can you know, just put more atoms in a cavity, which people have done, of course, uh, or you could start thinking about more degrees of freedom coming from the photons. So basically, forget about the cavity that defines a very well-defined optical mode and put the atoms in free space. And then uh, you end up, and if you uh, get the idea of order coming from uh, condensed matter physics, you end up with arrays. And these arrays are, uh, you know, they're going to be uh, 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 collective phenomena and excitations of these atoms. But now the excitations are going to be, um, uh, can either live in the plane of the array, they are going to be bound to the array, and this is the same as in a condensed matter system, or they can uh, radiate away, escape, because this uh, a system can radiate photons away because it's an open system. So that will be a significant difference. And so I wanted to start by discussing the differences between optical systems and condensed matter systems. And they all come from the fact that, um, in my opinion, that electrons have a charge and photons do not. So in an optical system, a uh, photon number is not conserved. So let me explain what I mean by that. So imagine that you have a wire, metallic wire, you apply a voltage, and then some electron is going to flow from one side to the other. If you, uh, the equivalent situation in an optical system would be a fiber where you sign a laser and uh, at a given frequency, omega, this generates some uh, uh, a stream of photons that propagate, and they are bounded basically to the fiber because the fiber has a refractive index that is different from one. So now if I imagine that I place a defect close to my fiber, uh, as the photon propagates, it has three possibilities. It can be transmitted, it can be reflected, but it can also jump outside to free space. And again, this is because there is density of states for the photon in free space to exist. And so this is a mechanism that is just doesn't happen in traditional closed uh, condensed matter systems. So it means that optical systems are inherently open. The second thing that is important is that photons do not interact with each other. Uh, and this is very different from what electrons do. So if you have two electrons, they are going to talk to each other via the Coulomb interaction or some screen version of it. Uh, but if two photons cross each other, uh, in particular in vacuum, they would not, like, they would propagate as if the neighbor is not there. And so to make photons interact, they have to be interfaced with matter. And in particular, um, the matter I care about is either atoms or other sort of quantum matter. And so what I mean by many body physics in optical systems, uh, uh, it's that I care about the problem of atoms interacting with each other dissipatively. So people have uh, started to, uh, to work in, in this, well, I mean, people have worked in this problem over decades, but, uh, in particular, in the in the situation of order arrays, this has been a more recent development, uh, mostly because now there are experiments that uh, uh, enable theories to think about this. Um, and so, most of the work so far that has been done, I uh, was here. Uh, I have some examples. Uh, pertains to the regime of just one excitation in the atoms, which is basically one photon, or just a few. Okay, so people in particular have shown that. Um, the idea of uh, this uh, uh, correlated dissipation can be uh, uh, harnessed to realize quantum memories that perform much better uh, than what is traditionally um, thought about. Uh, they have also demonstrated that a single 2D array of atoms can behave as a perfect mirror, which is remarkable given its thickness. Uh, of course, if you apply a magnetic field and you place the atoms in a honeycomb lattice, you will have uh, the typical chiral edge states. Um, and so another example of free body physics is that in 1D uh, uh, arrays, 
these excitations uh, fermionize because of interactions. Okay. So also I said that there are experiments showing uh, this type of behavior. So in 2020, there are two uh, beautiful papers, uh, one by the group of Emmanuel Bloch and one by the group of Antoine Broways. And so in the first case, what they did is precisely bring to reality the idea of a 2D array of atoms being a mirror. So they place the atoms at a distance that is smaller than the wavelength of the relevant transition. They send light and they see reflection. Okay, and so in theory, if this lattice is infinity, infinite and there is no disorder, just have a reflectance that is one in resonance, but because of experimental imperfections, the reflectance was 60%. Uh, another example uh, here is, uh, it pertains to 1D arrays. So this is, even though you cannot see it, but these are like individual atoms and they are sending light. And so they measure uh, some resonance, some frequency shift in the light, that emerges because these interactions within the atoms. Okay, so you can think of them as little antennas. And so these both experiments are performed in a single excitation regime, which is a uh, very low intensity. You only populate, uh, basically, you only excite one atom, but it's in a superposition, so you don't know which one. Um, and the calculations of these, like in theory, this is very easy to calculate because in this limit, the atoms behave as antennas. It's all just classical light poles, and there is no much complexity, like uh, finding these results directly. But what if you start putting more and more and more uh, excited atoms in your ensemble? Then the problem is extremely hard to solve. This becomes a many body, a strongly interacting problem. And so I, what I want to discuss today is the problem of Dicky super radiance. This is the first many body problem in quantum optics. And I'm going to explain to you, uh, you know, the origin of this problem. So in 1954, Dickey published a very, uh, I don't know, pioneering paper, uh, which has a very uh, strong abstract, which I'd like to, to read to you. So it says that in the usual treatment of these problems, molecules radiate independently from each other. This simplified picture overlooks that the molecules are interacting with a common radiation field, and the model is wrong in principle. So he was concerned about what happens when you have a bunch of molecules and they are placed very close to each other such that they start interacting. And so um, the idea is the following. So if you look at the photon emission rate, which is basically some intensity as a function of time, if the molecules are uncorrelated and so they are excited, they are going to decay as if the neighbor is not there. So you should get like the typically boring exponential uh, photon emission rate. However, if uh, they are correlated, what happens is that the photon emission rate, it starts growing. There is a point where it reaches a maximum that produces a super radiant burst of emission. So very fast, very intense radiation, and then it decays. And this is a signature of correlation. And so what happens here is that this is an example of emergence of macroscopic coherence through dissipation. So as the atoms, they start, the atoms start or the molecules from a product state, they are uncorrelated. They start decaying due to vacuum fluctuations. And as they start decaying, they start to synchronize. And when they synchronize, they start developing a very large dipole moment. So there is coherence. And this leads to this really rapid burst of radiation. Okay. So uh, this means that many atoms radiate differently, not just more. Okay. And so people have, uh, um, I mean, since the paper of Vicky, uh, people have worked a lot in this area and they have uh, thought about using this idea of super radiance to produce a new type of lasers, which are uh, super radiant lasers where uh, atoms are placed in a cavity, but this is a bad cavity. So the length of the cavity is much larger than the length of the atoms. So the cavity just provides an optical mode, but it's not a very narrow, well-defined optical mode. Um, and the lacing occurs because of super radiance. Uh, these uh, ideas do not only, or the, the idea of super radiance is not just something that occurs for atoms or molecules. It has been observed in other systems, such as, for instance, in perovskites. So, um, you know, with solid state emitters. And Dickey solved the problem in a cavity, which is the same as all the atoms or molecules being exactly at the same point because they all talk to each other at the same rate. Okay, so this is a problem that has very high degree of symmetry, and this is why it can solve 
exact, can be solved exactly. It's just a few lines of algebra. And the never ending question since Dickey's paper is what happens in extended systems? So after Dickey's paper, um, you know, there was a very large, uh, you know, the community in quantum optics and atomic physics, they started thinking about what happens when you um, take these atoms that they are all in the same point or in a cavity and you start to spread them a little bit. And so as an example, I want to show you a very nice reference or super radiance uh, by Gross and Haros in 1982. So this is a very long paper, but one of the things that they discuss is um, van der Waals defacing of symmetric super radiant states. So basically they say that dipole-dipole interactions breaks the permutation symmetry of this atom field coupling because uh, different atoms in the sample have different uh, close neighbor environments. So imagine that you, instead of having all the atoms in one point, all talking at the same rate, you start spreading. So atoms over here uh, see a local environment very different from the atoms in the bulk, if you wish. And so they started thinking, well, maybe if you have something that still preserves some permutation symmetry, like a ring, you may still have super radiance. And so this is, you know, one of many papers. Uh, it's a review paper, so in some ways it's special, but, you know, I could show you hundreds of papers trying to, to uh, answer this question. And it is kind of uh, remarkable that people were thinking about this back in the 80s because they were having discussions about what, whether a sphere would, uh, you know, be super radiant or not. And I've been told about kind of uh, fights in conferences about this. And in some ways, very science fiction because nobody ever could uh, prepare a sphere of atoms. You know, it's like it's not, or a, or a plane. This was not available. People could only do clouds uh, until very recently. So there are uh, now experiments where people can realize mesoscopic order arrays of atoms. So here are examples. So. Um, the first uh, set of the slides shows uh, atomic arrays realized with optical tweezers. So every point that you see here is a single atom that is fluorescing. And then they uh, switch on optical tweezers, which are little lasers, and they uh, uh, trap atoms. And then uh, they can rearrange the tweezers such that they produce an order array. Okay, So this can be done in 1D. It can be done in 2D, so you can produce things like hearts, uh, and it can be done in 3D. Uh, and like here is a, an Eiffel Tower by the group of Paris. And there is also a very recent and nice experiment by uh, the group of Hannes Vernier in Chicago, where uh, I don't know if motivated by the Eiffel Tower, they also decided to do Chicago landmarks. So here we have uh, a couple of them. So this is what, uh, you know, it's a very recent progress experimentally. Uh, and at the same time, uh, this again can also happen in, so with solid state emitters. So there are examples of people uh, making a race with them. So in this case, uh, you can uh, take a 2D material, place it on top of some silicon nanopillars. This is going to create some quantum dots. And then you have a bunch of little quantum dots that you can play with. And so uh, we can get again to to the initial problem that this is, you know, we have to understand the many body dynamics of these systems. It's a very complicated thing, but now we have extra motivation because people can do experiments. So it's a good time. And so uh, let me just uh, give you a hint of the problem. So we know that in an extended lattice, there has to be a crossover between leaky super radiance and monotonic decay. So why is that the case? So if you have a uh, uh, for instance, one D array, and you place the atoms very far away from each other, the field decays as a power law in free space, which means that for very long distances, the atoms do not see the neighbors and they should decay independently. So this is would lead to uh, exponential decay. On the other hand, if they are all exactly at the same point, this is the problem of Vicky in 1954. He solved it, and we know that we have um, super radiance where the burst of emission does not happen at the beginning, but it happens at a finite time, okay? That is different from zero. So in between, there has to be some crossover. But finding this crossover and understanding these dynamics is some problem that is actually exponentially hard because we have to evolve this system in a Hilbert space that scales us two to the n, where n is the atom number. So let me try to explain what happens for a single atom, and then I'll try to, I'll, uh, 
go to the situation of what happens when you have many of them. So I'm going to explain uh, the decay of a single atom in terms of quantum jumps. So imagine that you have an atom with two levels, so a ground state and an excited state. So I place my atom, my electron, in the excited state. Uh, and I look at the excited state population versus time. So what I'm going to, to see is that the atom is at the excited state, okay? And at some random time, a photon is emitted and it decays to the ground state. And this emission of a photon happens because of the action of a jump operator, which is a sigma minus operator that brings my atom from the excited to the ground state, okay? So it annihilates, annihilates the excitation. So this is a stochastic process uh, that is driven by vacuum fluctuations. And photons are going to be emitted not only at random times, but also in random directions. But on average, there will have an, a dipole pattern. So imagine that, uh, again, I want to do this experiment. So I place my atom back to the, to the excited state. And at a, some other time, it will emit a photon, OK? And then I do it again. And then this jump happens at another time, OK? It's random. But then if I repeat this many, many, many times, what I end up is with some exponential decay at a rate that is given by the spontaneous emission rate in vacuum, OK? So this rate is determined by the environment. It will be different if you are in vacuum or if it's uh, the atom is in a cavity or, you know, like depending on the environment, this rate can be modified. But basically, this idea of jumps is a, is a discretized version where you can see the stochasticity of this process. And when you look at the average of many of these jump trajectories, you recover the density matrix ensemble description of uh, this system. So now let's go to many atoms. So this problem is a complicated one because you have many atoms, m. So you have a Hilbert space of 2 to the m. And on top of that, you have many degrees of freedom that are come from the photons, OK? So many optical modes, in particular in free space, you have infinite. So it's a very hard problem. So one first thing that we're going to do is we're going to consider the optical degrees of freedom and environment. So basically, uh, I'm going to uh, trace out the photonic degrees of freedom. And I'm going to end up with an open quantum system that only consists of spins, atoms. Uh, where the interactions are long range and they have a coherent part, but also a dissipative part. And this dissipation comes precisely because I have integrated out the photons. And so now my um, I will have an equation of motion for the density matrix that only depends on the atoms and that reads like this. So you have a part that is the conventional evolution with Hamiltonian. This is a coherent part of the evolution that conserves the number of excitations, OK? But then I have another term that is called the Lindblad operator. This term is responsible for the dissipation. It lowers the excitation number. So it uh, is responsible for the emission of photons. And uh, I can write it in terms of collective jump operators, which are these O's here. And these collective jump operators are the same as I had for a single atom. But now, so a sigma minus acting on atom i, but now they act collectively on all, in all of them, OK? So then I have a superposition of these sigma minus operators. So basically, I have atoms jumping from the excited to the ground state with some sp spatial profile. And this is a collective jump operator. And this will generate a photon that will propagate, and it will have some specific uh, far field profile. The action of these jump operators is given by these decay rates. Okay, so there might be jump operators that act very often, okay, which have a very large decay rate versus others that are do not. Okay. And uh, these n jump operators, you can find them as an eigenstates of a n by n matrix of elements given by the imaginary part of the Green's function. So this is the propagator of the electromagnetic field. Uh, between atom i and atom j. And so this is where you build the geometry okay, of your lab. So if you have a 1D array or a 2D array, or that is what uh, it will be given here. And in free space, this Green's function is uh, easy to compute. 
is given by this expression here, where uh, R is just the difference between Ri and Rj. Uh, and as you can see, it has a, a power law decay. So it goes as one over R cube, one over R square, and one over R. And it also depends on the polarization. This is a tensor. So this just represents the fact that an atom is a dipole, and it emits a, a, a field that it's going to have some different polarizations in different points in space. Okay, so this is basically the starting point. And what we want to calculate is the rate of photon emission. So the rate of photon emission is also the rate of change of the number of excitations, but with a minus sign. So as the number of excitations decreases, this is uh, minus the rate of photon emission, okay? Because losing excitations means emitting photons. And this is just the derivative of the population of the uh, atoms, uh, which I can write as, uh, as the uh, uh, rates of my jump operators and the expectation value of these jump operators, okay? Okay, so now let's go back to the problem of Dicke superradiance in a cavity, which again is the same as all the atoms in the same point. And so uh, I have a bunch of atoms, okay? Uh, I have a mirror, this sets an optical mode, uh, which means that the atoms talk to each other at the same rate. Uh, and this, again, I said is a high symmetry problem. Uh, due to the symmetry, there is only one relevant jump operator, which is uh, the permutationally symmetric one, okay? Uh, and then complexity is reduced because all the dynamics happens in a, not the whole Hilbert space, but just in a subspace of the Hilbert space that is that of the permutationally symmetric states. And it's exactly so long. So this is what happens. So if I classify uh, my states yeah, on, uh, based on the number of excitations, I start with all atoms excited in a product state with n excitations, and I go down to zero atoms excited. All the atoms are in the ground state. And while I'm going down, I'm emitting photons, okay? And as you can see, I only populate the states here. For instance, there is just one atom in the ground state and all the others are in the excited state. And this produces this emission of photons. So I'm going down dissipatively down this chain, okay? And so instead of showing, you know, this plot, I can show you, uh, you know, a ski analogy of this situation, uh, which I will do in the next slide. So. I want to say that initially there is no coherence in this state and coherence emerges through decay. So you start having superposition of states because you have decay. Uh, and the important thing here also is that the action of a jump imprints a phase on the atoms that stimulates the action of the next jump. So this is not a stimulated emission. It's not like the population in the cavity of photons is larger. It is self-enhanced a spontaneous emission, there is a difference, okay? So example, this is basically a photon avalanche, okay? So you have some quantum fluctuation that produce some, you know, radiation of photons and uh, they do so, this radiation occurs into a very defined optical mode, which in this case for skiing is, you know, some mountain ridge. So there is a very dominant decay channel that is defined by the cavity. So if you go to an extended system, this becomes a very hard problem. So you have to solve this uh, equation. Um, and I want to explain why this is a problem. So in free space, I said that the interaction depends on the interatomic distance, but the lack of symmetry yields exponential complexity. So again, if you have an interatomic separation of zero, uh, because the decay is confined to these permutational symmetric states, you have only n states that matter, you can solve it exactly, and this leads to a burst. If the interatomic separation is infinite, then you just care about single particle states. There are only n of these, and the decay is exponential. But if the interatomic par particle is finite, in principle, you have to do the n states, and uh, this is a mess. So we can try to solve these equations uh, you know, numerically. Uh, for different geometries. And so these are, this is the photon emission rate versus time. And this is for a line of atoms. This is for a ring because it's a geometry that people care about back in the 80s. And we also did it for a two by two array. And so it looks like there is for at least certain dis distance, there is super radiance. On the other 
Also, we see that the dimensionality matters. But on the other hand, these calculations are done only for 16 atoms, uh, which means for a 2D, 2D array, this is a 4x4 four four lattice. So it's really sad. And this took us one week in the Columbia uh, uh, high performance computer. So, you know, it's not great. So you could say, well, is this all that we can do? Or can we do something else? And the answer is, luckily, we can do something else. So the first thing that we can do is look at what how these uh, equations look when you add the Hamiltonian versus if you remove them. So I said that the important thing is the dissipation. And this plot seems to confirm that. So basically, the, the Hamiltonian doesn't seem to be doing much in killing super radiance, in contrast to what people thought back in the 80s. OK, so the dynamics is mostly dissipative. So it's mostly given by the jumps. OK, so this is one important hint. The second hint is that what happens if we transition from all atoms very close versus atoms farther away? So here is a plot of a 1D array. So this is the distance equals to 0. And as you start to spread it, then what you see is that this bump goes down. And it starts also happening earlier. And at some point, it crosses to an exponential, OK? So this gave us a hint that actually what we care about is maybe not so much the whole dynamics, which is very complicated. We can just look at the derivative of this curve at, a, at t equals 0, which means that the atoms start this synchronization that leads to super radiance either at the beginning or not at all. So you either start in a good path or, you know, Super radiance will never happen later. OK, so what we are going to do is we can, with this uh, kind of hint, we can exponentially reduce the complexity of this problem. So we can look at the minimum burst that we can have, that is that the first photon enhances the emission of the second one, which is equivalently to say that the derivative of the photon emission rate is positive. So this is the minimal condition for super radiance. And so we can calculate this numerically, and actually we did. Uh, but we found a more elegant way of calculating it, which also um, has connections with the statistics of the photons, which is an important quantity in quantum optics. So what we can do is we can calculate the second order correlation function at t equals 0. So this basically is the ratio between the probability of emitting two photons versus the probability of emitting one square. If this is larger than one, then the condition for this minimum burst is fulfilled. So you can do all the algebra. And what you end up with is some um, ratio between you know, four operators, four jump operators versus two squared. Okay? And so when you do all the math and you say that, well, these jump operators are related with uh, uh, you know, this um, annihilation operator, uh, operators or sigma minus operators, you do all the math, and what you end up with is the following condition. What you care to have, like the condition, minimal condition to have super radiance, is that the variance of these decay rates normalized to the single atom spontaneous emission rate is larger than one. So what is this, uh, not mathematically, but physically? What matters is the number of decay channels that there are in the problem and the competition between them. So what you want is to have very few dominant decay channels versus you know, a bunch of them that they compete with each other. That would lead to a lower variance. Uh, and so getting this condition first gives us a hint to the physics of super radiance. And actually, it connects it more with the uh, physics of avalanches. And the, also, the maybe other important thing is that we have come from solving a differential equation in an exponentially large space to diagonalizing just this n by n matrix that I can write trivially. And I can do that not for 16 atoms, but for 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 7. Okay. So just to prove that this is a good figure of merit, I wanted to show you the time of peak emission of the burst versus our figure of merit that is the second order correlation function. So I said that there is super radiance as long as G2 is larger than 1. And so this is precisely what we see here for different geometries. So when G2 is smaller than 1, there is no burst because the time of peak emission is t equals 0, which is this exponential decay. 
However, as we start crossing, as we cross one, the time of peak emission is no longer zero, but it happens at a later time. And so uh, this means that G2 is actually a good figure of merit for all the cases that we have tested numerically uh, for super radius. Okay, so then why do I care about lattices at all, besides having you know extended uh, extended samples? The crucial point here is that the interatomic spacing controls the number of radiative decay channels, which is the number of relevant jump operators. So let me explain why this is the case. So imagine that I'm going to explain it in 1D, but this is generic also for 2D or 3D. Just 1D is easier to understand. So imagine that you have a 1D array and along C, and the atoms are separated by a distance D. So I can calculate the decay rates because this is the imaginary part of the Green's function between every two pairs. And I can uh, do the Fourier transform of that, okay? I can now look at, uh, at uh, a dispersion relation, or if you want, or I can look at the decay rates, but in the Brillouin zone. So it's not a dispersion relation, it's an imaginary dispersion relation. So these are the decay rates based uh, uh, versus the wave vector in the C direction. This is the edge of the Brillouin zone that is determined by the distance. Okay, so you see that there are very two very different regions here. So there is a region in gray that is what is called the light cone. And then there are regions not in gray that uh, clearly the decay rates there are zero. So let me explain why this is the case. So um, a photon in free space cannot have any arbitrary wave vector because there is a relation between frequency and wave vector that is the speed of light. So um, this, these wave vectors or allowed set of wave vectors for a given frequency that is the atomic resonance frequency are those of the light cone. This is the only possibility. Um, as soon as I have a wave vector for my uh, uh, spin excitation that is larger than that of K0, that is omega zero over C, this cannot produce photons that propagate because it's not allowed because of uh, energy momentum mismatch, which means that the decay rates of spin waves that have a, a, a wave vector larger than K0 modulus, then they have to be dark. Like they are states that are dark. These are dark states, uh, subradiant states. And so this happens because of destructive interference. So there is destructive interference in the far field means no, uh, no uh, photon emission. And so it means that interference enhances certain decay channels constructively or suppresses others destructively. And the distance centers here because um, these dark states only occur for certain distances or more specifically below certain distances. So in 1D, this distance is half of the wavelength. In 2D, this distance is the wavelength. Uh, and this happens mostly because if you look at this picture, imagine that I make my uh, distance between the atoms uh, very small. So what I'm doing is, you know, I keep the light cone fixed, but the whole region zone grows. So then I have a very large density of dark states. And in the other uh, 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 direction, let's say, if I make my distance really, really large, my region zone is very, very small, such that eventually all of it is embedded in the light cone, which means all the modes are radiative. There are no dark modes. And this makes sense because as I make my atoms to be farther and farther away, what I'm having is they interact less and less. So the destructive interference is less uh, important. It cannot cancel radiation into the far field because now you have basically independent atoms. Okay, so the interatomic distance uh, controls the number of radiative decay channels. And I told you that the number of radiative decay channels and the variance, basically how dominant some are versus the others, is what determines whether I'm going to have super radiance. So let's see if this is true. Oh, one thing that I wanted to say is for finite uh, systems, is uh, what I'm going to have is I'm going to be probing points in this dispersion relation. Okay. So uh, more and more as I increase the number of atoms, and then this kind of block description. Uh, uh, fits the system better. Okay, so this is just to show you that indeed you have these are the decay rates versus interatomic distance. This is for 1D, for 2D, and for 3D, and this is G2. 
And so you can see that in 1D, you have a bunch of dark states below a certain distance. In 2D, these dark states appear for larger distances, and in 3D, even larger distances. And this is also somehow correlated with this Green's function, uh, sorry, this G2 crossing one, which is this condition for super radius. Uh, and one thing that I should say is that this depends on the polarization of the atoms, the quantization axis of the atoms, because the Green's function is a tensor. Okay, so we can do the calculation in 1D, and what we find is the critical distance normalized to the atomic resonance and wavelength versus the atom number. We can take a very large uh, atom numbers and diagonalize this numerically. And what we find is that uh, below this critical distance or this one for the other polarization, there's going to be a burst and above there will not be a burst. So it means that in 1D, you're going to have super radiance as long as the distance between the atoms is smaller than this critical distance. Uh, we can also do these calculations not just uh, uh, numerically diagonalizing very large matrices, but also analytically using this trick of going to uh, Fourier space. And so then we find that the uh, infinite limit, infinite lattice limit agrees very well with the numerics, okay? And so basically the critical distance in 1D is below half the wavelength, which is the, the distance below which the, there are dark states. And precisely because there are dark states, some other states become, or some other jump operators are very dominant. And therefore that's why we have super radiance in 1D. We have super radiance because we have sub radiance. So sub radiance help make some other channels dominant. So in 2D, something surprising happens. So this is the critical distance versus atom number. And we see numerically and also analytically that the critical distance scales sublogarithmically with atom number, which means that for large enough atom number, this you know, critical distance can be as large as we want, even beyond a wavelength. And so you can ask yourself why. So let me show you uh, the decay rates, the same as I showed you for 1D. These are the decay rates for two polarizations in um, reciprocal space. And so what you're seeing here is that um, you have a bunch of um, you have a bunch of dark states. Now the light, these light lines now become a circle, okay, because this is 2D. And what you have is a bunch of dark states for k larger than k0, which is determined by the radius of this circle, um, uh, for one polarization and for the other. Okay. And then on top of that, you see that just at the border of this circle the decay rates are very, very, very large, okay? So this is true if you have a, a, a distance between the atoms that is below the wavelength. This is where dark states, these dark states emerge. But what happens when uh, the distance between the atoms is larger than a wavelength, then the dark states are not dark at all. So why do we have super radiance? And this seems to point, this is something that we have to understand better, but this seems to point to the fact that the origin of super radiance in 2D is different from 1D, at least when, you know, for very large atom numbers. Um, and this is confirmed in 3D. So in 3D, we go for a critical distance that scales faster linearly with atom number, at least that's what seemed to happen uh, numerically. Uh, and this seems to point to the, uh, notion of super radiance in 2D and 3D emerges because long range order. So 2D in analogy with phase transitions, even though this is not a phase transition because this is not some ground state, a steady state dynamics at all. This is something transient, okay? But um, in any case, 2D seems to be some uh, critical dimension. In 3D, you have super radiance for any uh, distance. And below 2D, you should not have super radiance because there is no robust long range order, uh, which is precisely what happens in you know, like the theory of phase transitions. But uh, thanks to dark states, you have some notion of super radiance. So in 1D, destructive interference creates super radiance. Above 2D, constructive interference gives rise to super radiance. So with this, uh, 
I think I want to, uh, you know, I'm approaching the end and I'm pretty excited about all these ideas of, you know, many body physics in atomic arrays uh, because I think we have solved a question or at least began to solve a question uh, that has been the question in the field for a long time. Uh, but I'm more excited even about, you know, given this new understanding of many body decay in a race, can we answer new questions? What are the new questions that we can address? And so I think there are, I'm very interested in driving these systems uh, and see what, whether, you know, in, in super radiance in a cavity, uh, and the super radiant laser works because you have, you change the environment, right? Uh, and you make one dominant channel because you have mirrors. In free space, it's a very different paradigm because your dominant channel emerges from the geometry. You don't change the environment. You don't select an optical mode. It is selected by the geometry, right? And so then it's like, if I start pumping this, I'm going to have a super radiant laser. Can I have lacing without cavities? Uh, I think it also uh, uh, has pointed out in, to us in, a, in an interesting di and direction to develop computational techniques to solve this uh, dissipative uh, many body uh, evolution. Uh, another thing I want to understand is I've been talking about super radiance and, and so on, but I'm also very interested in sub radiance or in preparing dark states. So, what if instead of going down this super radiant route, you know, that uh, all the, these super radiant jump operators are acting all the time. What if I trick my system into going down a dark path? So uh, this means that I can prepare states, in particular many body states that are entangled and some of them may have metrological advantage. So doing that is hard because this is a stochastic evolution that in principle is hard to control, but we might be able to, to do that using measurement and feedback. Uh, and then with dark states, you can play a lot of uh, cute things. Like you can do, uh, you can also do two photon gates, uh, maybe for quantum computing and so on. Uh, and another uh, question that I think is interesting is how all this correlated dissipation impacts uh, uh, quantum simulators uh, that are currently using uh, Rydberg atoms or arrays of Rydberg atoms. And then you can continue down a you know exciting path of increasing the degrees of freedom, uh, like for instance, uh, adding hyperfine structure, the fact that atoms are actually multi-level systems, you can think of disorder or uh, adding, you know, thinking not about free space, but other reservoirs, like for instance, a waveguide or a transmission line, and try to think about super radiance and many body decay uh, in other type of situations, such as that of superconducting qubits, for instance. And so with this, I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, the both uh, uh, the people involved in this work, in particular my postdoc Stuart, uh, who has um, been a leader of all this work, and also my student Eric. And if you want more details, here are you know a bunch of references. Um, and I also wanted to point out that uh, our idea of uh, using G2 as a predictor of super radiance has been uh, taken by uh, Francis Robichaud, and he has written a very nice paper where he extends our results to multi-level atoms and more importantly, to directional super radiance. So instead of what I've been describing here is being, you know, super radiance as emission of photons integrated over all volume, okay, over all space. And he has adapted this technique to what happens if you put a detector in some direction, uh, which I think is really important because um, it has an obvious experimental connection. And so I think with this, I'm done and yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thanks Anna for an excellent talk. Uh, please go ahead and ask your questions. Can I ask the question about your square root log n? My, yes, give me one sec. A square root of log n, yeah. Is this, is this uh, I mean, did you prove it or is this observed? This? So we first did it uh, numerically, and then we also you can prove it analytically. So I, uh, so how you do it is basically um, okay. So I can tell you okay. Yeah. 
So you want the variance of your eigenvalues to be larger than one. So in the variance, there is a notion of gamma squared, right? So then you, instead of summing over all modes, you go to Fourier space, so you integrate over a wave vector, okay? And so then you have to do an integral in uh, uh, to the uh, momentum space of gamma squared. So gamma uh, can be found because it's uh, the Fourier transform of the this Green's function, so this is known. And so what happens is that exactly, let me show you. Yeah, exactly, so this is gamma. So now it's like, we're talking about gamma squared. So exactly at this border, just as, k equals k zero, this is divergent. And this type of divergence is logarithmic. You can prove that it's logarithmic. And from this logarithmic, plus the fact that you have a square, then you get the square root of log n. So it's just a typical logarithmic uh, divergence that comes from the fact that you have a propagator in 2D. Yeah. So you cannot, there are like some, uh, so this you can prove analytically. There is exactly the prefactor. It's hard because, uh, you know, it's complicated to, to find the prefactor, but, uh, you know, it might be three, it might be four, I don't care. But the scaling is actually pretty easy to prove. And you can see the details in, uh, oh, I don't know, we put this on the archive. In the archive, I think we said that numerically this is the case, but now we have the analytical proof as well, so we will have to update the archive. Yeah. Great, yeah, thank you. Other questions? Hi, Anna. Very nice talk. Um, it, it was nice to hear the, the results on kind of the scaling with dimensionality for regular rays. Um, do you have any kind of intuition or feeling if there's uh, anything to expect from sort of other arrangements like quasi-crystals or hyperbolic lattices or things like this? Yeah, well, I don't know enough to say about hyperbolic lattice. I also know if I know enough about quasi-crystals, but uh, I think in 1D, the fact of having order is really important because you have um, super radiance because you have dark states. But in 2D and in 3D, at least beyond a wavelength, it looks like super radiance emerges because of this long range order, right? It's robust to fluctuation. So uh, the order doesn't seem, so long range order in the sense of like correlations between the spins, but not that the crystal is ordered. So, uh, this seems to me at least to point to the fact that you don't need order in 2D and 3D. So I would say that uh, probably just a cloud of 3D atoms, a very low density, is it should be super radiant. And this seems to be what people have seen in the experiments. It's just the literature, at least in my opinion, is a bit messy because it's like people have looked at this in like many different uh, situations, but there is no unified picture, but yes. So I don't know quasi crystals again, because I don't think order is important beyond the wavelength. Uh, if you give me a 2D or 3D quasi crystal, I'm willing to bet that it's going to be super radiant, but it would be interesting to take a look at that in more detail. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, yes, I have a question. Um, can this also affect the absorption? Can you have like super absorption? Um, I don't know if super absorption is the... <laughs> no, I just made I it up. No, 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 yeah, sure. So yes, I mean, it's not just emission, it's a uh, different absorption or the scattering is different. So an example, at least at the single body level is uh, the mirror, right? So if you have a single atom, the probability of reflecting a photon tends to zero because you barely, the light barely doesn't see the atom because it's just like this little point. But as soon as you put this uh, to the array, uh, because of uh, constructive and destructive interference, the reflection can be 100%. So yes, both absorption, reflection, scattering, and so on are uh, definitely uh, affected by interference. Uh, it's I don't know, that's a good question. Like, I don't know if you place a bunch of atoms all in the ground state and you now dry, you know, like you start like pumping them, like uh, how all this evolves. Uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know if you get super absorption. I never thought about it. Maybe I should. Okay. A nice question. Oh, thank you. All right.
right. Um, maybe I'll ask a quick question. So at the end, you mentioned uh, like multi-level atoms and different pathways. And of course, this is something that's always on my mind. So if you have like this population inversion and you have, for example, more than one ground state, can you kind of think of that as like competing super radiant pathways in parallel? I think uh, yes, but I think this is the case. And then, so there are several things that I should say about hyperfine. The first one is that hyperfine structure, it's a mess. It's a horrible mess. Even at the single excitation level, it becomes a many body problem because when you have at least two ground states, like it's a horrible thing. So, but it also means that you have a bunch of dark states that are not the conventional dark states. You have like new dark states that come just from the fact that you have dipoles in different directions, uh, which has no longer dipoles because just no cla not classical. There is no classical analogy to them. Um, so I think you may have this competition, but I think there might be also a maybe more interesting way of thinking about it where in 1D, you know, you have these dark states um, and super radiance because of this geometric, like it's the geometry what produces them. But maybe with hyperfine, you can, uh, with these internal degrees of freedom, you can have additional dark states, which happen not because of geometry, but because of the internal degrees of freedom. So it might actually help. I don't know if you would like just have more dark states and less bright states, or like I would need to think about it. But I don't think it's necessarily awful. <laughs> I think actually it, it could be interesting. Yeah, but we haven't started looking at it. I see. All right. Uh, if there are no further last minute questions here, let's thank Anna again for an excellent talk. Thank you.